And open your Bibles, please, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, preaching through the Sermon on the Mount and still closing off now the Beatitudes. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up to men ready to serve you with those. Kingdom living, the blessing of persecution, the blessing of persecution. Most of us have no idea firsthand about real persecution, but there are some folks from Romania. You can talk to our Romanian folks there. They understand that. They've experienced some of that. They've lived through some of that. So you can speak with them. Most of us in America, though, have not, but you can talk to them and you can see that. So tonight I'm going to ask that you... Envision that you are in an area, in a land, where pure persecution for Christianity is prevalent and expected. If Jesus tarries his coming, I expect us to experience more and more persecution. I can't help but to know that and to believe that. So when you listen to it tonight, don't listen to it as, well, that's something for times past, that's something for other countries, uh, but no... Picture because it can come here, and I believe it will come here if he tarries. And so look at it tonight to help us be ready for when it comes. This is one of those things that you have to be ready before it comes, before persecution comes, just like you have to be ready before the trials come, just like you have to be ready before the sorrows come. So when they come, you're ready. God has equipped you already. So that's what the passage is tonight, looking at the blessing of persecution. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ, Jesus, shall suffer persecution. So that's a promise that that will happen if we're trying to live godly in Christ Jesus. So looking at the Beatitudes, Christ speaking to us about how to have kingdom living today, looking at the blessing of persecution. So again, picture yourself in a country or in a time where when you leave here tonight, you don't know whether or not the police will be at home waiting for you. That you don't know what's going to happen at work tomorrow. That kind of mindset, that kind of persecution that's quite possible and is going on around the world tonight. So Matthew chapter 5, so as we look at that and listen to that and what God's trying to help us with tonight. Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, looking at verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye. When men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Father, help us tonight. Lord, again, for most of us, it's beyond our understanding of our personal life, but not out of the realm of possibility. We think of folks in our midst that have been through that. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us be equipped, help us be ready, help us anticipate what you have for us, help us be ready to encourage others that may be going through persecution. So speak to us tonight, God, like only you can, and prepare us for the time ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Looking at the Beatitudes or the blessings, the blessings of living, with the kingdom idea, the kingdom paradigm. Now, it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident that God has put these Beatitudes in a particular order. Uh, I mentioned last week about the twins, but as I look at it, I think it's the triplets of blessings. Look, if you would, as he begins, he put these in order. It says in verse number 8, blessed are the pure in heart. So we talked about being pure in heart. By the way, if you have not listened to those or weren't able to be here for those, we encourage you to go back and, and listen to those online and understand it. So the pure in heart. Then he goes to blessed are the peacemakers, and then now to blessed are the persecuted. And so we're talking, I don't think it's an accident, God puts those triplets together. Uh, purity, peacemaking, and persecution. It's an amazing thing about true Christianity. When I'm talking about true Christianity, folks that are following the Bible, folks that are following Christ, folks that say, first of all, I want to be pure in my heart. I want to be pure in my life. I want my life to be honest and holy and right and do right by my neighbors and do right by Christ and do right by the Bible and do right by what God would have me to do. And that will make you be a peacemaker. So somebody who has a heart to be pure, somebody who has a desire to be a peacemaker, you say, why in the world would they suffer persecution? That's exactly what we see. 
people that are trying to live right. That's why the Bible says, Jesus said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. That means pure in heart. That means being a peacemaker, that trying to help people, not trying to cause problems, but trying to be a blessing to people, shall suffer persecution. So the more we're like Christ, the more we will suffer persecution. The more we live like Christ, the more challenges we'll have along that way. So we're looking at this idea tonight about the blessing of persecution. Now, let me under, let's understand, first of all, not all persecution has to be a blessing. If you're persecuted because you're a crook, don't expect to find blessings in that. If you're, if you're being persecuted because you've got a big chip on your shoulder and your attitude's wrong and you're uh, being impure or not being pure in your heart and not being a peacemaker and not following the cause of Christ, don't look for blessings in that kind of persecution. But... Those that we're going to find there is criteria. God says the persecutions can be a blessing. So tonight, let's go as quickly as we can and let God speak to us to prepare us for this time of persecution that will arise. First of all, we see the criteria for blessed persecutions. The criteria for blessed persecutions. In other words, the persecutions that will be blessed, the persecutions that can be blessed, and how we can have that. Notice, first of all, in verse number 10, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So the first criteria we say, we have, God gives us to say this is a blessed persecution, this is a happy persecution, is as a result of righteousness. A result of righteousness. Again, look at verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That means living right. That means living godly. That means living trying to please God. If we're not trying to please God, if we're not living righteous, if we're not living right, then that persecution that comes to us, we can't say, well, what a blessing this is. No. But he says, blessed or happy are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. So as a result of righteousness, that's a criteria. So you say, preacher, I want to be ready. Well, live right. Live godly. Live holy. Live true. To our Savior. I believe it's in your notes there. First Peter 2.19, is it there? Talk to me, class. First Peter 2.19? It's not there? Ah, well, let's open up our Bibles then to First Peter, all right. First Peter chapter 2. And when you're passing Hebrews, I want you to mark that one also. We're going to do some turning tonight. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 19. Oh, helps me be in 1 Peter. I'm in 2 Peter. All right. No wonder it didn't look right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. Again, we're talking about the criteria is to live righteous. If we're going to have that blessed persecution, it's going to be a, it needs to be a result of righteousness. Verse 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Again, having a good conscience toward God, having your walk with God right. He says this is thankworthy. Verse number 20, for what glory is it if when, if when you be you buffeted for your faults, he said, if you're persecuted, if you're suffering because you did wrong, he said, there's no glory in that. There's no glory in going to jail for robbing a bank. There's no glory in jail for stealing uh, from the government. There's no joy. He said, there's no blessing in that. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, is it acceptable with God. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So in that passage, we see that the idea of having a blessing, the idea of having joy, the idea of being acceptable to God in our suffering is if we do it for conscience toward God, and we do well and suffer for it. Do well and suffer for it. Doing right. Doing right. When we suffer for doing right and do it with patience, and you take it patiently, that's acceptable. So to understand, if we're going to have the blessing, a criteria for blessed persecution, to say, yes, we can have that joy, and the Holy Spirit will give you that joy, it's going to be as a result of righteousness. A result of righteousness. That's a criteria, Jesus said, for having this blessed persecution. Secondly, back in our text in Romans, uh, Matthew chapter 5, it's to be, a, be false if we have an evil report. 
It needs to be false if we're going to have, an, if it is, an evil report. Look at verse number 10 again. Let's go to verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. What's the next word, class? Falsely for my sake. So we're going to find that a criteria for blessed persecution means that persecution is going to be as a result of righteousness and the persecution is going to be a result or the testimony is going to be false if it's an evil report. In other words, it's not, you're not going to do evil and get in trouble for it. You're not going to do evil. It's going to be a false report. Notice again what it says. And verse number 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Falsely. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 14, it said, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Listen, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And so suffer as a Christian, godly, holy, soul winning, getting the gospel out, telling the truth. And so we're not to suffer for wrongdoing, but suffer for right doing. Are you listening? Do you hear the difference on that? Suffering for right doing. Yeah, we might suffer if their attack on us is true because they say, well, you're just a Christian. You're just getting the gospel out. Let that be so. But don't let them be able to persecute you for doing something wrong, for being immoral, for being illegal. He says, don't let them do that. Don't suffer as a murderer. Don't suffer as a thief. Don't suffer as an evil body or evil doer or as a busybody, but suffer as a Christian. So you understand, so God gave criteria for the blessed persecution. Not all persecution is going to be blessed. It's going to be blessed if it's a result of righteousness. It's going to be blessed if the, if the persecution comes because the report is false in, as far as being evil towards you. Number three, a blessed persecution criteria is, is to be endured for Christ's sake. If it's endured for Christ's sake. Verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Here Christ is talking about for the name of Christ. So it's going to be blessed if we're enduring for Christ's sake. Not if you're enduring for your sake. Not if you're enduring for my sake. Not if you're enduring for the Baptist's sake, but the blessedness of persecution. When persecutions come, we can have a blessing in that. We can have that blessing, that joy in that, if we're doing it for His sake, if it's about the Lord. So you say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that if the day should come where persecution is rampant in this country, whether it be prison, whether it be hospitals, whether it be uh, abuse, whatever it might come for the cause of Christ, if it's a result of living right, if it's false accusations about us doing evil, and if we're doing it for the name of Jesus Christ, God says there is a criteria for blessed persecution. So the idea is if we're experiencing persecution, don't think about the church. Think about the name of Christ. If you're suffering persecution, and it may be torture, it may be uh, different issues, don't think about, well, it's just for the church, it's just for my own testimony, it's for the preacher, it's for that. No, it's for Jesus Christ. So if we want to have blessed persecution that Jesus is talking about here, it's going to be as a result of right living, it's going to be a result of living right and not being evil and enduring for Christ's sake. That's why Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Acts five forty one. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Criteria. God says, let's make it clear, that is the blessedness. That is the type of persecution that you can be blessed in. So we find the criteria. And secondly, 
Again, I want you to picture that you might be going home tonight and find the police there. You might go home tonight and find out that they've already ransacked your house and looking for Bibles and looking for tracts. Uh, maybe in the workplace tomorrow you would lose your job. That kind of mindset. You say, boy, I want to be blessed in that persecution. All right. Do right. Live right. Make sure it's not true when they say evil against you and it's doing for Christ. Number two, we find the compensation for blessed persecutions. So you don't say, well, I was blessed, but God's got some compensation for us also. By the way, God is good at compensating. You talk about bonuses, you got some good bonuses from God, some compensation for blessed persecution. Look at verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's back up. Verse number 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So very quickly, God says, here's some compensations. Here's some blessings. Here's some, some payback, if you will, for suffering persecution under the right criteria. First of all, number one, the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice he didn't say that you'd be a subject of, but a possessor of. Not just a subject, not just going to be there, but a possessor of the kingdom of heaven. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? As I was meditating on that and thinking about it, I kind of think about like America. As an American, I claim America. I may not own a deed down at the bank for one square inch, but it's still my country. I still claim America. I still, if you will, own America. America is my country. I would fight for it. I would die for it. It's my land. It's my home. It's my people. It's, it's mine. Not just something I'm passing through. Not just something I'm just kind of in here for a while. Not something just because I got my name as a citizen, but I claim it as mine. America is my country. And so it says here, when we suffer that, he said, we have that. Then he says, ours is the kingdom of heaven. It's not just subject of, it's a possessor of. I think that's pretty good. Amen? Part of the kingdom of heaven is that ownership we have, that peace of heaven then, yes, but also a peace of heaven now. God says, boy, blessed are you. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. But not just the kingdom of heaven, but notice the rewards in heaven. The rewards in heaven. Now, if God wasn't going to give us any rewards, still being blessed in persecution would be good. Amen? They're having that joy and peace. But he said, beyond that, there's some rewards for suffering this right kind, this blessed persecution, the rewards in heaven. Notice what it says. Verse number 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rewards in heaven. Well, we sing about it. We talk a lot about it. But let's be honest. We don't know a whole lot about it. I mean, we can go down and do a study on the different crowns and whatnot, and we can study about uh, the judgment seat of Christ and how we're going to get rewards if our works are, after their works are tried by fire and they sustain through the fire gold and silver and precious stone. But we don't know much of the details of the rewards. But I can tell you this, it's going to be something. It's going to be something. That's why in Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings, that's the persecution of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's going to be something. I have not. All, I have no real clue on what it's going to be like. I have no idea what the crowns really look like. I have no idea the other blessings and rewards, but the Bible does talk about us gaining rewards, maintaining rewards. He warns us about losing rewards. He talks about not having rewards, but I'm here. He's talking about the rewards for suffering. It's going to be suffering. So, uh, something when we suffer and God gives those rewards. Very quickly, just some thoughts from the Bible about those rewards to help us in persecution, in the trials. So while we're suffering, we can, yes, think about Christ, yes, realize that we're being blessed in the persecutions, but also God promises the rewards. Number one, we find the choice of Moses. The rewards in heaven was the choice of Moses. 
Hebrews 11, 24. Is that in your notes? All right, look at what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Let's look at that. Moses being raised as the next, many theologians think and historians think, raised as the next Pharaoh of Egypt. I mean, he was there. He was taught in all the intelligence and all the sciences. He was living in Pharaoh's house, being raised as Pharaoh's uh, grandson. He was, he was going to be the, probably the next Pharaoh. He was in, in line. He was, had all the prosperity, all the good living, all the joys, all the things this world could give him. And he was there, but it says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He said, I'd rather suffer with my people as the Jews. And you know, so he left. He went out and had that and killed that Egyptian and he was on the run and he came back and God used him to deliver uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt. But the Bible tells us he chose. He said, I can choose to live as Pharaoh's grandson. I can choose to live here in the palace with all the gold and all the finances and all the pleasures and all the treasures. He said, I can do that. Or I can suffer persecution and affliction with God's people. And it says he chose that rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, we begin thinking about that, and the Bible tells us in that passage why. Because he understood about the recompense of the reward. He understood about rewards. He understood that the reward was coming in heaven. And he said, I'd rather have the reward in heaven than the rewards that are here right now. So he chose to suffer. So I began thinking about that. We are not to that place, most of us. I mean, we can't... <laughs> We can't even choose to get up at 9.30 to come to Sunday school. Amen? All right, we got to be here, much less. So we have to decide, I'm going to choose to suffer for God's people. So Moses' choice. Notice what it says. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. You look it up in the dictionary, recompense is a compensation or a reward given for loss or harm suffered or effort made. Let me read that to you again. Because see, Moses, he says, he said, I looked at this thing. He said, I can go ahead and live here with the pleasures of sin for a season and all in Pharaoh's house, or I can suffer now and get the reward later. But he esteemed that reward much better than the reward of living here in this life in Pharaoh's house. He looked and he, cho he chose wisely. Why? Because he had esteeming there the reproach of Christ. Being criticized as a Christian, being criticized as God's people, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Recompense, compensation, or reward given for loss. Or harm, suffered, or effort made. Boy, I'm glad God knows how to recompense. Amen. He knows. Boy, we say, well, I've lost some things down here for Christ. That's all right. Guess what you got coming in recompense. You say, but I've given up so much here in this world to serve Christ, to go to a mission field, or to serve Him, or to live holy, or live right. I've given up so much. Yes, but you don't know the recompense that God has planned for the loss, for the effort, for the things we've given up. And so Moses chose that. He chose the rewards there to go along with the persecution. I said, I'd rather have the persecution now so I can have the rewards later. So we're not so sure about all the rewards God's got planned, but we know that Moses made the right choice. So we're going to choose. You and I have to choose the things of Christ or the things of the world. Number two, we find that these rewards in heaven, Moses chose as the choice of Moses. Secondly, we see it's the claim of the martyrs. It's the claim of the martyrs. Hebrews chapter 11. Is that in your notes? Oh, good. Hebrews 11.35. Well, we ought to go back and look at all, but for the sake of the time, we won't. It says, it goes through about all the people that were persecuted, all the people that were killed and slain for the cause of Christ. It says, women received their dead, 
raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. So they were persecuted for the cause of Christ. They met the criteria, all right, because it was for right doing, it was false lies about them, and it was also for the name of Christ, not accepting deliverance. They said, we're not going to get out of this. In other words, they could have gotten out of it. They could have escaped the torture. They could, they could have. By the way, that's all when Apostle Paul, before he was, when he was still Saul, that's all he was wanting to do is deny Christ. He said, you deny Christ, we're, we're done with this. You blaspheme God, we're done with this. We don't have to go any farther. But if they would not, he would have them stoned. He would take them into prison. And so they could have accepted deliverance. But they did not. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, it says, when it's all said and done, we'll have something better at the end. When it's all said and done at the end, when we have our resurrected bodies, when, when time is no more as we sing, and we've got the resurrected bodies and eternity begins, he said, it's going to be better. He says, by us suffering now, we'll have a better reward then. By us, by staying true, it's not just the suffering. Again, it's not just the suffering. It's suffering for Christ. It's suffering for truth. It's doing right. It's living godly. And if we said, for, we're going to live godly, we're not going to step aside. It's by living for Christ, we're not going to step aside. And by doing that, we're not going to accept deliverance because we know something better is at the end. So they're able to claim that reward. I began thinking about that. Is there anything we can claim? The better resurrection. Is there anything we can say? No, I'm claiming that because God has promised that for the end. Just write it down. Revelation chapter 20. It talks about those beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Boy, they got something coming. Something coming. So the, recom the compensation for blessed persecution Yes, it is the kingdom of heaven, but it's also the rewards, God says, in heaven. The one, the choice of Moses, the claim of the martyrs, and the crown of the faithful. The crown of the faithful, Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. See, God says, don't, don't fear the things you will suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful. Faithful unto what class? Death. And I will give thee a crown of life. So there, if nothing else, we have the promise of a crown of life for being faithful unto death. As we suffer, as we suffer, if we take this persecution for Christ, meeting that criteria, and we stay true, faithful unto death, even if they kill us, or we stay faithful until we die, regardless of whether they kill us or we just die of old age, but we're being faithful during that persecution, he said he's going to give us a crown of life. Those crowns we can cast, the Bible talks about at Jesus' feet. Well, I'm telling you, there are some rewards, some compensation for blessed persecution. So we remember these things when the persecution comes. It's for Christ. It's for right living. It's for being what God would have us to be. And then God gives us the promise of some reward. So we see the criteria for blessed persecution. We see the compensation for blessed persecution. Then back in our text in Matthew chapter 5, the commands to the blessed persecuted. To the blessed persecuted. Back in verse number 12. First word, verse number 12. What is it, class? Rejoice. Preacher, I thought we were talking about persecutions. Yeah. Jesus is talking about persecutions. He's talking about people that are going to be dying and suffering. Rejoice and be melancholy. Is that what it says? No. Be exceeding glad. So God gives two commands here to the blessed persecuted. Those at persecutions. Notice he didn't say pray. Though we probably will, and we should. But he didn't say pray. He said rejoice. You know, the rejoice here means full of cheer, or calmly happy, or well off. It's not an exuberant kind of rejoicing. It's a good spirit. It's well off. It's all right. Things are okay. Things are okay. So when we rejoice in the testimony of a good conscience, we can suffer. So we're to rejoice. We're to be full of cheer. Calmly happy, well off. That's rejoicing. But then it says we're to be exceedingly glad. The word exceedingly glad there in the, in the Greek means jump for joy. Jump for joy. 
So we're supposed to rejoice. That's kind of on the inside. Yeah, things are okay. Yeah, things are good. How are things going? Great. Super. Wonderful. But beyond that, we're also supposed to be exceeding the day. Jump for joy. To exalt. Well, we're supposed to be jumping for joy. When's the last time you jumped for joy? When's the last time you jumped? You see kids do that sometimes. You go, yeah! That's what we're supposed to do. That's the command. He says, don't just pray. Just don't muddle through. Don't just grit your teeth. But we're to rejoice and be exceeding glad. So on the inside, we're supposed to be rejoicing. That calm well-being, yeah, things are fine. No problem. No problem. But also on the outside, jumping for joy. And again, we don't even do that when things are good. Maybe we would learn to do that if things weren't so good. Maybe we begin to look for Christ. Maybe we look for things that God's doing in our lives. But he says, Jesus said, this is going to happen. So he gives us the command. Very quickly, let's notice the company of the blessed persecuted. The company of the blessed persecuted. Verse number 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That means jumping for joy. Far great is your reward in heaven. There it is. It's great in heaven. It's not just a little reward. It's not just something from the five and dime. Anybody even know what those are anymore? It's not more than something more than from the dollar store. How about that? All right. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted, said because he said so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the prophets that were before. That's our company when we're being persecuted. For righteousness sake, when we're being persecuted for the cause of Christ, when we're being persecuted for doing right, and they say all evil of men are against us falsely, he says you can rejoice in that, you can jump for joy in that, he says because you're in good company. He said because that's what they did, that's what they did to the prophets that were before you. So thinking about the Hebrews 11, thinking about the Old Testament prophets that were beheaded and slain, and those folks that were tortured and killed and put in Prison for the cause of Christ and for the cause of God. He says, it happened to them. You rejoice because you're in good company. You're part of the crowd. Very quickly, when we think about the company of the blessed persecuted, by the way, that will help us when persecution comes. Because, first of all, we find they are our predecessors. They are our predecessors. I don't think I had you mark it, but let's let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be closing out here in just a moment. Hebrews chapter 11 again. These are our predecessors. They've gone on before us. Hebrews 11, verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report. What all? Verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. And they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were cut in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, their heads were chopped off, their bodies were slain. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They're our predecessors. Our predecessors. I mean, they went on before. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm saying, no matter what happens to us, we won't be the first. You will not be the first. You say, well, preacher, what if they throw me in jail for having my kids in a Christian school? You wouldn't be the first. Well, what happens if they, for the cause of Christ, I have to be beheaded, or the Muslims come and they chop off our head like they, we see the, on the Internet a few years ago, or like those in Revelation chapter 20? You would not be the first. Well, what happens if they, they abuse us and torture us? You would not be the first. What happens if they take all the money that I have and they take away my job? You would not be the first. So he said, rejoice, jump for joy, be exceedingly glad. He says, why? Because it's gone on before. The prophets, those people we look at before in the past, it's happened to us to them before. And if Jesus tarries, it won't be the last time it happens. So they are predecessors. They've gone on before us. Not only are they predecessors, but they're our partners. They're our partners. Hebrews uh, 11 verse 39. 
And these all, these folks that were tortured and destitute and cut in two, wandered in caves, all those things, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. That happened before Christ. That happened after Christ, but still not the promise of heaven. God having provided some better thing for us, Listen carefully, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, their goal, their journey, their life, their persecutions, their rewards, if you will, won't be full, won't be mature, won't be complete without us. We're in a relay race. The best illustration I've seen for that a relay race. In other words, they ran before and handed us the baton. And we're going to run, and if Jesus tarries, we'll have to hand the baton off to somebody else. Through that race, they were tortured. Through that race, they were sawn asunder. Through that race, they were blasphemed. Through that race, they did all those things. But they made it through the end of their life, and they passed it off to that next generation, and to the next generation, and to the next generation, down to you and I sitting here in 2019. And if Jesus tarries, we need to pass it off also. We are their partners. They're our partners. So he says, rejoice, be exceedingly glad, jump for joy, because you're in good company. Because what they're going to do to you, they've already done to the prophets that went before you. So they are our predecessors. They are our partners. And if you will, they're our purpose, patience, and pleaders. They're our purpose, patience, and pleaders. I couldn't figure out which one to go with, so I put them all down. Because it goes on to chapter 12. Again, the divisions in the Bible are not inspired. That's just a breakdown. So it says, verse 40 of chapter 11, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Wherefore? Are therefore, because of that, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What witnesses? Those guys that went on before. The ones that have gone on to heaven and they're waiting for us to finish the race. They're rooting us on. They're pushing us for it because their race is not done unless we complete it. Their, their reward is not complete unless we complete it for them. He said, we were surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when we think about those people, our company, yes, there are predecessors. Yes, there are partners, but it's also our purpose. Boy, why keep going? Because I'm running a relay race. If you've never run a relay race, you've never run, you may get tired, you may get weary, but boy, one of the things that keeps you going is because those other guys ran before me and they handed it off to me. And my purpose is I got to hand it off to the next person or go across the finish line, whichever case it is. So it becomes our purpose. It says, seeing we're surrounded by those folks, our purpose and boy, let us run the race. Let us say, lay aside the, the weights and the sin. It's our patience. Notice what it says back in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run with patience. The race is set before us. I just, I, just, I just can't bear it. I just can't keep going. No, think about the ones that have gone on before. Next time you want to quit because somebody laughed at you for carrying a Bible, think about those who were sawn asunder. I'll give you some patience. That's our patience. When they wandered through destitute and all their possessions were taken, dipped in oil and burned as a light-up uh, pharaohs or the king's palaces, fed to the lions, kids fed to the lions just for the pleasure, just for being Christians. In most cases, we'll say, you know, it's not so bad. It gives me patience. But not only that, there are pleaders cheering us on. I believe that. They're surrounding us. We've got a great crowd of witnesses. The blessing of persecution. Got to meet the criteria first, though. In conclusion, very quickly, three quick thoughts about the blessing of persecution. Number one, we ought to live as if there was none. We ought to live like there was no persecution. You say, preacher, what am I talking about? Just live right. Don't be afraid to be a witness. Don't be afraid to be the light. Don't be afraid to be the salt. Don't be afraid to do just Just live like there wasn't going to be any persecution. Amen? Are you out there? Don't say, oh, what are people going to do to me? No, just live right. Live, by, live like there was no persecution. Don't fear it. Don't quit. Don't hesitate. Obey every prompting of the Holy Spirit. Number two, look backwards, 
upwards and forwards when it approaches. Look backwards, upwards, and forward when it approaches. In other words, when it begins to come, when persecutions come, you begin to see it in other people's lives, or the laws will get stronger and stronger against doing what the Bible says, then we can just look backwards, upwards, and forwards. That means we look back at the prophets. We look upward to Jesus, and we look forward to the rewards. Amen. Boy, when it, you see it coming, boy, you just remember. Man, look back at those prophets. I look up to Jesus, and I look forward to what the rewards are. And then lastly, leap for joy when it comes. Leap for joy when it comes. We have to understand persecution will come because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We've not yet in this country. Some folks have said in this room have. Their families have gone through it. But not us. It doesn't mean it's not coming. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. See, it's not just them. It's me. <laughs> it's me. It's you. See, I say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Father, we thank